If you don't have a clear vision that's really focused and you can articulate that well and you can back that up with a solid financial plan and a strong product market fit that's well demonstrated through your history, that's going to be a, that's going to be a huge, huge challenge. I'm excited to continue our conversation. We began in, in our last um, episode around sharing what is your software, your platform around proposal management and how it's kind of changing the game for those who do a lot of RFPs, RFIs, RFQs, all the RFs. Now, this has been eight years in development and building it. Tell me, how did you get to where you are today? What's, what's your story? You can even go beyond before eight years. Yeah, well, we started a business in Cape Town, South Africa, actually back in 2004. It was a software custom development company, and it, it, it went pretty well. It was actually a great lifestyle company that we had uh, through that, that time period. But we wanted to build something that was bigger, something that could make a, a meaningful contribution into the, into the sales process. And uh, so around about 2008, we started to see this general problem around proposals in many of the customers that we were working with. And we bootstrapped ourselves through that initial process of building out an initial product there and, and taking that out to, to market, uh, probably getting it into kind of a, a close product market fit around about you know, 2010. Um, at the time, we still had two companies. And we realized, hey, we needed to, to focus and, and separate the two businesses. So ultimately, we sold the lifestyle company and focused ourselves into this, into this product business. And then we started to see some great traction, the kind of traction that comes when you, when you focus, right? Uh, and we started to sell the product that we had developed into the United Kingdom first, and then ultimately expanded that uh, into the U.S. And it's really here in the United States that that traction really started to build in the the very healthy markets that, that are here. Um, but we landed some marquee customers through that process that validated that we had a really good idea, but that there was a strong market for RFP responses. Customers like Microsoft, like Hitachi, uh, like Insight here in the US. So that prompted us to refocus efforts now into the US. I actually moved here in 2015. Um, and started to drive the business from here, and you know it's been a it's been a great run uh, of of driving the business and just just growing and and learning and and expanding our horizons. Uh, relate Technologies was that the lifestyle business? You got it. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so you that was started two thousand four, and it went to two thousand fourteen. You said two thousand ten is when you started doing kind of the uh, bootstrapping the, the concept. Yeah. And you, you've listed 2012 as your official start for, for, for Chorus on here. So it sounds like, what was the, the turning point of 2012 that really could, took off? Well, we had a piece of intellectual property that we were selling out of a lifestyle business. Right. right. Okay. <laughs> and it was difficult for us to, to get the right traction and momentum when you had that split focus between the two. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, there was so much demand suddenly coming up out of, uh, out of the UK, out of the US. We realized that unless we put all of our energies into this intellectual property, this, this product that we had built and really started to you know, market that correctly, sell that correctly, that, that we wouldn't see success or we would see a mediocre level of, of success there. So that's what made us move. And then changing into saying fully focused, this is where we're going, put all energy in. You started Bootstrap, but did you then get funding for it? Yeah, we did. Uh, we raised funding. Now, that, that was a, an interesting experience because we were South African uh, in our structures. In fact, right up until last year, until 2019, we were a South African um, kind of holding company on this. So when we raised funding the first time, which was in 2013, uh, we couldn't raise in the U.S. So we raised rounds in South Africa, um, which would be seed rounds uh, in the US, but in South Africa, it was actually private equity that we had to go to, to, to raise the funds and the money there. And that kind of seed round just got us into the US, helped us hire our first sales teams here, helped us develop the marketing that we needed into, into the US. Um, we rode that up right up until 2019. At the start of this year, we closed our series A with a US uh, venture company after having switched the company from a South African business to a, to a U.S. business. 
Between those two experiences, what would you say is uh, one of the biz- biggest mistakes one could make uh, when seeking funding? What is one of the biggest mistakes? Well, not having a clear vision, I think, is really challenging. If you, if you don't have a clear vision that's really focused and you can articulate that well and you can back that up with a solid financial plan and a strong product market fit that's well demonstrated through your history, that's going to be a, that's going to be a huge, huge challenge. Um, in, in raising capital. You, you need to show and be passionate, obviously, about your vision, but then have the financial plan and the traction, the historical traction to, to, to demonstrate that you're able to, to achieve some of those things that you set out to do. Growing it, funding is one piece, but then actually getting clients and growing the customer base, that is one of the biggest uh, first pieces you have to tackle. Any insights or, or uh, takeaways you can share of whether it's getting the first couple of clients on a SaaS type platform and then scaling beyond the first few. We focus very much on landing marquee clients as our first, our first client, landing reasonable brands out there. And we invested a lot of time and energy from the founders to the product team and actually getting to those brands, making sure that we understood their requirements and we were able to fulfill those, those requirements. Um, we did that very early on because we, we knew once we landed the marquee brands, if, if other companies could see that we were successful in a big organization that trusted us, that we had, we had proven ourselves, then scaling further was, uh, would be easier. And, and that certainly worked well. We invested a ton of time in the first, I'd say, three customers that we landed. We were fortunate to land Vodafone in the UK as one of our, our very first uh, customers. They're still a customer today, which is amazing. Um, but really, they helped us to shape the product, sh- understand the space. And then we could use that brand and that experience to then move to a few others, develop the case studies there, and start to scale. What have you seen as far as common mistakes that people are making in with marketing and with growing their, their customer base in, in today's world and environment? Well, I think that... Um, there is a some, sometimes, and we certainly made this mistake, an, an overdependence on the inbound lead uh, coming in from from marketing. Um, I, that's a mistake that we made. I would say in, in at certain times, we we became quite drunk on inbound leads and uh, on, on that whole you know paradigm there. Um, but what we really started to see is that that's one component, and it may be a strong component, but you need to have other channels. Uh, developing and driving those leads into the into the business. We've had great success with trade shows as well. That's been a really useful uh, space for us. Of course, that was pre-pandemic. Uh, it's been it's been tough this this year um, with those types of things. And and then implementing an outbound strategy as well. You know, prospecting, getting out, having BDRs calling into that market. They're developing your brand as they're making those calls, as they're sending those emails. Uh, but you're going to pick up those nuggets where you're injecting yourself into that process uh, at a point in time that's right, and, and you're picking up those leads. So yeah, that's a mistake we made. Possibly other companies are making some of those mistakes as well. Helpful to hear it's important to not get drunk on just the inbound, but having a healthy multi-pronged channel strategy. Um, for that outbound, that, that BDR, the, those representatives reaching out, um, I imagine a lot of emphasis now going that direction because you can't go necessarily to trade shows in certain places. What are you going to, what do you feel is going to be a key way for those type of channels to be successful going forward? It's been interesting this last year because of the pandemic. There's, there's a few things. Well, one, as you mentioned, um, you know, trade shows, they were all online and while they're great for your brand, we didn't necessarily develop a lot of leads through those online trade shows. The second piece that's been interesting is that BDRs traditionally use the telephone quite effectively. And with everybody now working from home, what are you going to do? You're going to start calling cell phones. You're going to start calling home phones. So we really had to look at our uh, email functions uh, in the BDR area there. And what kind of message are we sending out? How do we differentiate ourselves? How do we personalize those messages to a greater degree? And how can we show that there are humans behind those messages 
and it's not entirely robotic. So we really had to focus our attention on that, the messaging around that, that email aspect to the business development function there. Uh, and I'm very proud of what the team's done there. They've refined and refined and refined that message uh, to get us a, a great increase in our outbound leads that, that we've seen in, in 2020. That leads us nicely into the next piece of uh, team and building the right team to be able to accomplish anything. Um, I imagine over these past eight years, there's a lot of team development. Um, when it comes to to hiring and building that team, um, what are some common mistakes uh, that you've seen have done, whether you've seen you've done it yourself or you've seen elsewhere that you would say, avoid this for sure? One of the common mistakes that um, I've seen and and I've certainly fallen prey to this mistake is being under pressure to make a hire and so compromising too too quickly to make that that hire. You know you need somebody by a particular date. You've got a group of candidates. There's a couple of them that you you like, but you're not completely excited about. And the time pressure forces you to make a decision and then you make a a mediocre decision uh, on that uh, that hire. Uh, Maybe you're compromising uh, culture to make the hire. Maybe you compromise, um, you know, track record to make that hire or domain knowledge. You, you, you're forced into making a compromise there. Of course, the worst compromise that you could make is the culture compromise. It's the values compromise. And, and we fortunately have not found ourselves in that situation. But you definitely do experience that pressure to make a decision to make a hire. And it's a tough balance because you don't also, you know, just defer the decision looking for a purple unicorn so that's really a difficult balance to to strike between you know a rushed hire that makes you compromise or holding too long and not making any hire because you're looking for something that just doesn't exist beyond a resume what methods do you use to assess uh, the potential of a candidate and when you're bringing them on well it's always you know, always interesting to go through somebody's resume and to hear about their experience. And that's a fundamental process. But I really enjoy the questions that a candidate asks me. I think that gives me a lot of insight to how they think, how they work. You know, what kind of questions are they asking? Are they truly interested? Are they researched? Are they offering a valuable insight? Are they interested in the future of where we're going? What kind of questions do they have uh, for us, for me? And uh, to me, that's that's one of the most valuable parts of, of any recruitment discussion is actually just hearing the questions that the candidate has. Obviously, over the years, the team grows and then you have people hiring other people. How, how big is the team now today? We're just short of 70. Gotcha. And it's it's over distributed a couple places or, or you mostly yeah. in Seattle? We are mostly the uh, client facing roles are in are in Seattle and the US and then we have engineering still in Cape Town, South Africa and a few client facing um, uh, folks there uh, looking after the UK and rest of world uh, team. Um, You know, that that's an interesting uh, dynamic to the business because Cape Town and South Africa are nine to 10 hours. Sorry, Cape Town to Seattle are nine to 10 hours in time zone difference there. Um, so it, it does introduce some very early mornings and late nights for, for, for both teams and you know, interesting learnings around how do you deal with that geographic separation. Any takeaways for others who do have multi-offices that are have hours between the teams? Flexibility is key. Obviously, you, you have to change your hours. You're not going to be able to just operate in your typical kind of nine to five type role there, but uh, leaning on collaboration tools. So we obviously use Microsoft quite extensively. We use Microsoft Teams um, as our, it's kind of like our our main tool. Uh, We are conducting meetings, developing videos, sharing files, having chats and discussions. Uh, That's that's critical. And during the pandemic, it's actually been good that we had some of those disciplines in place as we all now spread out further into our home offices and uh, into various areas there. So it was great having some of those disciplines in place. If I look at the cloud software that we've uh, purchased this year, it's, it's been increased. We've increased the use of cloud software, again, to just help us to work in a, in a very separated way uh, from a physical point of view. 
Do you see going back to the standard, the norm, everyone goes back to the office next year or what's, what's your plans? Great, interesting question. And there's just so much <laughs> variability uh, around that uh, today. I, I think where we're going to land up, and uh, I, that's all I can say, is that we're going to land up with a more hybrid model where we have collaborate, collaborative spaces available to ourselves, uh, where we can go into a boardroom with a whiteboard and you know, thrash out a problem or a strategy or an idea uh, with a big screen there, and we can talk about those things. But the actual desk situation where you know that's my desk and I go in in the morning and sit at the desk and then I leave in the evening I think that's that's not entirely gone but certainly reduced for many many teams because we can do that stuff from our home office now and really get together when we need to to collaborate and yeah that's what it feels like it's it's heading towards um, at, at this time any favorite books, audiobooks, podcasts, blogs, sites that you uh, would recommend or go to regularly? Yeah, I, I really enjoy reading books. So I recommend that do as much reading as you can because that is, uh, is, a, is a great basis. Um, Any favorite uh, ones pop out of your mind though? What's that? Any favorite? Uh, Any uh, favorites? Well, I've got a few go-tos that, uh, that I always go back to. So The Hard Thing About Hard Things is a key book. And... If you ever go through one of those difficult times in your business, that book just gives you some inspiration uh, to, to, to keep going. Um, we've just discussed again as a company, um, Lean Business. Uh, I think that's the, the, the name of the, of the book. I'd have to look it up, but it's, it's the whole principle of, of the, the Lean Startup. That's the name of the, company, of the book. And a lot of the principles in that and how those principles apply to the disciplines inside of the organization and, and, uh, and pushing that through. Um, a book that I read recently, Culture Code, Daniel, uh, I think it's Koite, that's how you might pronounce it, um, but really fascinating observations on culture and motivating teams. I thoroughly enjoyed reading that book. Um, and then, you know, podcasts and blogs, Jason Lemkin, Sasta uh, blog is a fantastic blog. Read just about everything that comes out from there. Uh, Best in SaaS podcast is a great one to, to listen to. I uh, thank our marketing team for introducing me to that one. So yeah, great to, to get those other experiences in there as well. Last question I have for you. What kind of tech innovations do you predict we will see in the near term, the next year and long term, five, 10 years? The coming of age of NLP and AI is, is certainly happening right now. And I think that that, that process is, is just going to continue to, to grow um, in the next few years. But the principles around virtual reality, augmented reality, I'm interested to see how that's going to play out in, in a few areas. Firstly, with the way that the pandemic has changed the work environment, are there technologies and tools there that will allow us to collaborate globally more effectively and to create this this feeling of togetherness when we're not physically in the same room, can some of those technologies introduce that into the workplace? But then even in our industry, how can some of those augmented reality technologies uh, benefit teams that are collaborating around documents, processes, and decisions? And how can they be applied and fed in to that process? And I, I'm interested to see how that's gonna expand in the next five years watching that space very carefully. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.